Well, what's up, my brothers? Hugh Halter coming to you from a, uh, a business center at a uh, hotel in Flagler Beach, Florida. So it's not very exciting. They will not let me into my room early. I told them it was uh, um, Hugh Halter. I've tried that all over the world. It never gets me anywhere. So I'm, uh, yeah, I'm stuck here. Thought uh, in between the rounds of the Ryder Cup, I would go ahead and share a few thoughts with you on the, our next uh, passage here in First Timothy. We're in starting chapter two, so if you have a scripture, get ready for that. Um, so yeah, yesterday I was actually in the state of Wisconsin watching the Ryder Cup, and if any of you have ever followed me on Facebook, this would be the time, but... I posted a picture um, of me and Sir Nick Faldo. I'm just minding my own business, walking down the path. And uh, early in the morning, I think I was the 13th person in. I got there like 6.30, waited early. And uh, here comes old Nick walking down the path. And our eyes kind of met. And I said, well, good morning, Sir Nick. And he said, good morning, sir. And uh, we got to chatting. He actually offered up a nice little photo, a little selfie that I took with. Uh, it's actually kind of embarrassing. I, I couldn't figure out how to make the phone turn around. He had to actually help me. But uh, he was a very nice chap, very gentlemanly. Uh, and if you've ever seen the Ryder Cup, uh, this might be the, the least gentlemanly golf tournament in the world. Is where people completely lose their you-know-what uh, rooting for the team. I was there on Thursday. It wasn't even the day that they're playing. Uh, it was just practice rounds. And uh, it, for the most part, the crowd was pretty good. Um, the players are fantastic. They will go at each other and then like completely give each other a hug, whatever. Very gentlemanly. But the stands, the crowd is a bit unruly if you've ever watched the Ryder Cup. And even on Thursday, like nothing is up for you know, for grabs yet, and there's there's hecklers all over dropping the F-bombs on these guys, the poor Europeans. But it's just kind of crazy when you think about how people react to people that are on the, the other side, whatever the other side is, on whatever issue. It could be U.S. against Europe. It could be Trump versus Biden. It could be whatever it is, but uh, I don't know. It seems like there's a lot of people that are just not very kind to those that have different points of view. Case in point, then uh, today I, fl I fly into Florida and I'm driving down the expressway to get to this little beach area. And here comes three trucks zooming by me, all with F Biden <laughs> signs all over them. So, you know, just depending on where you are in the country, uh, people obviously express different opinions and hold different opinions. and. Uh, apparently, people don't like uh, Joe very much down here in Florida. But uh, we're gonna, we we got to talk about this, guys. This has been a season where uh, folks are, are uh, I don't know, I think we're all struggling with what's going on in the world. Uh, we can't seem to figure out who can fix it. Uh, it's a time to be opinionated, and uh, it's a time to get obliterated over your opinions. The whole thing, and so I, I have a feeling that uh, as we walk through First Timothy, chapter two, it's going to actually mean something to you. Um, if you just read it, it'll seem pretty docile. It says, "I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, and intercession, thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peace, peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness." Well, here we go again. You get in there and. All they're doing is telling us to pray. Don't you hate that when people just go, no matter how bad it's going, just, just pray about it. It just doesn't seem like it's got the zing. And yet as we go through it, I think you're going to see that it does. A um, little story. I don't know if I shared this with you guys, but way back in the day, um, Cheryl and I did a church merge with a full African-American congregation in Portland, Oregon. We were the at the time, the only multi-ethnic church in the in the downtown city area or in anywhere in Portland. And we did it because I grew up specifically really caring about the white-black relationships and um, found out that there was this old church that the KKK built to keep all the blacks in one spot. 
in uh, North Portland, and it was under the floodplain. So they actually built a church building so that they could flood these poor folks out, which did happen. And uh, so we just saw a lot of stuff. I was the area director for a youth ministry, mostly working in middle schools and high schools, primarily within the black context. And over years, just saw quite a bit of things I did not know existed, and it really opened my eyes as a young man to uh, what's been going on. Still learning, but um, it captivated my attention and uh, the things that I saw happening and then obviously learning and reading about uh, the race history in our country. It just became almost like an inconceivable idea to me that people could hold a people down uh, to that extent. And then when I began to study church history and seeing that uh, the church oftentimes was not fighting against that, hardly ever did, but oftentimes propelling it forward it just became something that was very important to Cheryl and I, and so we actually uh, merged with a full African-American congregation. And it was kind of a, a life, a life's fight, so to speak, something that I really cared about. And then, our, interestingly, our youngest daughter married a young African-American man that grew up in the projects of San Bernardino, a uh, kid named Jesse. Amazing young man, got a football scholarship to a little uh, reform college in Iowa. That's where he met my daughter. And uh, now they're part of the family. We've got a little Ezekiel, a little grandson. And uh, one of the stories as, uh, you know, early on when they were in Alton, uh, Jesse and I were just sitting in our truck just talking. He wanted to, to talk through some stuff that was going on with McKenna. And so I said, hey, meet me at this park. And uh, so we, I pulled in early and then Jesse pulled in behind me, got out of his car and jumped into my pickup truck. And and I'm not kidding, within two minutes, we were surrounded by police cars, five of them. Uh, all of them drew guns and came up on both sides of the truck. And I remember seeing this in my rearview mirror. And I told Jesse to take his hood off. We both had our hoodies on. It was freezing. So I said, just slowly, you know, take your hood off and let's roll down the window so they can see us. And I said, let's just be cool, survive this thing. And, uh, and they were very aggressive. Um, it really inappropriately so asked me what we were doing there and I said I was talking to my son-in-law and they didn't buy it at first I'm not sure might have been that I was white he was black but uh, we were pulled out of the trucks uh, they found an old rifle shell from my elk hunting days in Colorado and that's apparently that's a felony in the state of Illinois so they were uh, in the middle of uh, potentially handcuffing me and uh, Jesse helped talk our way out of that, and we, uh, we escaped unscathed. But uh, I remember looking at Jesse across the hood as we were both being frisked and just making eye contact. And um, I don't know, it was just one of those moments where I just, the, the anger and the rage came back, and it was everything I could do to, to hold my stuff together. Um, they only let us go because I let them know I was a business owner around the, the the corner at Post Commons where a lot of these guys get their coffee. And uh, so as you can imagine, the next day I went down and had a little chat with the uh, police chief about that scenario. But, I, you know, I just remember just feeling like I just wanted to, to lose my mind. Jesse and I and then our other son, Matthew's full Mexican, have had talks together about the world that we are raising their kids and then our grandkids and what's the right thing to do if we're ever out in public and our very multi-ethnic family ever encounters anything. I was actually bringing it up like, guys, uh, you should keep an eye on me because I'm not going to be able to handle it very well. And it was Jesse that that really coached me as, a, as his dad, if you will. He said, yeah, like if, if something were to ever happen, we're sitting at a bar or whatever and somebody starts to flick us, crap he said i just so i want so you know i don't want you to do anything i'm, I'm like what do you mean not doing anything? i've been doing something my whole life about this issue why do you not want me to do something he said well because i can't do anything i'm a teacher i'm the only black teacher uh, in a 40 percent black high school um, jesse understood the power of his position in, in that school and that probably people uh, may not even want him there even as the only blacks teacher and he said I don't get to fight for myself 
because there's too much to lose if I stand up for myself with some knucklehead at a bar. So he goes, I for sure don't want you to stand up for me because not only is it dishonoring to my story that I can't fight, um, but it just doesn't settle, it doesn't change anything. And obviously he's, he's speaking from experience. And I just remember feeling pretty proud of him, but also enlightened to the fact that Jesse did not want me to fight the way that I would normally fight for issues. Well, that is the backdrop of this passage. And I, I took some time to share that story because I want you to see that we don't need to like exegete this. This is pretty straightforward, but you need to understand the context of this so that it won't just go by you. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority. Okay, uh, The context of their world that, that Paul is writing this to Timothy in is uh, they're under the reign of a dude named Nero. And I know you've heard of Nero. He was uh, like the, the worst Roman emperor <laughs> that the world's ever seen. He was the one that was known for impaling Christians through the undercarriage and then the spear would go out somewhere like here and then they would uh, hold them up around the gates of the city and they would light them on fire. So Christians were essentially being lit on fire. That was Nero that did that. And so in the days that these guys uh, were trying to process what's, what, it, what does it mean to be a Christian man? What's it mean to be a Christian leader? Um, it was way worse than what you and I, it's not just guys going F Biden down the road with their flags on their pickup trucks. Okay, this is serious business and it would have been of utmost interest to Christians like, well, what are we supposed to do about it? How do we fix the world? How do we really make any difference at all? Or do we just let it go on or whatever? Well, here it says, make petitions, prayers, and intercession, three different types of I guess, um, ways to battle. Petitions, obviously a petition is something that you get with a lot of other people. You usually have to have, what, 7,000 uh, signatures in order to get any new idea moved through. And that's what he's talking about is that, like, get, get your, like, if there's something going wrong in your world or your neighborhood or the city that you live in or the country that you live in, don't just run off in the flesh and don't go vigilante like Hugh Halter would. Uh, rally up your community and begin to pray together. That's what it means. It's, it's petitioning, bringing the community together to pray. And then obviously prayer is just simply asking God uh, for his hand. Now remember when Jesus taught us about uh, the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 16. He said, I will give you guys the keys of the kingdom and then I'll build my church on this. And then whatever you bind on earth will be bound. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose. He was actually giving the early disciples a little bit of a, an idea that you guys are going to actually have real incredible power to change the way things are. And this is what he's talking about, is that our primary battle is to pray and to intercede, if that makes any sense. So don't just go past and go, they're just asking us to you know politely pray. No, this is actually the way that we war and the way that we fight over things. And that's, for somebody like me, this has taken my whole life to actually settle this issue that I have no power in the flesh, um, but that there is real power to loosen up things that have been bound up tight and there's power to unloosen things that have been tightly bound, if that makes sense, okay? So we bind and we loosen. And so, so we get our friends together and we pray together. That's why in your men's group, I hope it becomes part of what you do is that you literally take time, not just as like a covering prayer, but you actually go to battle for the things that are coming up with each other and the things that you're really concerned about in the world. So we petition, we pray, and we intercede. Intercession is a unique type of prayer, and, and try not to forget this. Intercession is going to God on behalf of somebody else or some other situation, and you're offering yourself as an answer to that prayer. So. When I roll in and I talk to the police chief the next morning, that's, that's actually intercession. That's a walking prayer. I'm going in to go, I want things to be changed. I don't want, um, you know, and I brought it up to him. I'm like, your boys were pretty aggressive uh, before they even asked us what we were doing. All the guns were drawn. I said, you know, 
is that like how they were trained? He said, no, that's just kind of Alton. That's because they're used to a lot of bad stuff happening when a young black man gets in a older white man's truck. They're almost always doing a drug deal. And so the neighbors have seen this so many times, they just called immediately because they're, they're, they're sure that's what's going on. He goes, it's not right, but that's what that's from. And so we talked about it and he said, look, I'm going to bring it up with the guys and hopefully it will make some changes. So that's in a sense, an idea of intercession. Okay. You actually are going, you're, you're seeing the problem, you've prayed about it, and now you're going to go offer yourself as an answer to that prayer potentially. Um, so to me, it's an active type of praying. So when you th- see things going on where I saw things re- regarding a black-white relationship, it caused me to intercede by planting a church and working as a football coach in certain high schools that were different than what I would have normally done. But all those are actually active prayers, and they do change things, all right? they do. And you have to remember, guys, when we see things going on in the world today that we feel powerless against, remember that the early Christians took down Rome. <laughs> so these were all these completely, uh, seemingly powerless guys. And then they would uh, march to like things that they heard Jesus say, like when somebody slaps you on the right side of your face, turn to them the left side. And that was not Jesus going, hey, I want you guys to be wimps. He was literally saying when a Roman walks by and just tries to belittle you in front of your family and takes a backhand across your face, just stand up tall and turn to him the other and give him a little wink. Give him a little smile. Let your family know it didn't hurt you that bad and you're not afraid. It was literally an act of rebellion and an act of resistance uh, for men to actually intercede. And so uh, I hope this like totally blows the lid off what you think praying is. Um, But this is what Paul and Timothy are trying to get on about is we've got to do this. So let me just keep reading. Um, So pray for those kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Good picture of the kingdom of heaven that people would just live this way. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Then he goes in verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Okay, so this is um, in anything like where there's an F. Biden sign, and then on the other side there's people that hate Trump, or you take any other political issue, those on one side of the refugee dilemma, those on one side of the border crossing issue, um, those on one side of an abortion issue, those on one side of a gay issue, whatever it is, um, that when you find people on opposite sides, they by nature are enemies, okay? When Jesus walked in the, on the earth, he came as a reconciling force. This is why Jesus actually is the only answer for the world. When I was down in the Middle East uh, working with uh, Palestinian and Israeli, there might be not a older conflict in the world than that, and when we're with the Israeli side and then we go with those on the Palestinian side, there's literally no possible way that they can reconcile except as both a Palestinian and an Israeli said, the only way that we could ever fix this would be Jesus. And so when you put Jesus in the center of the conversation or the center of the room, something begins to change because he dies for everyone. And so somehow we're able to see each other uh, maybe differently, we don't write each other off if we hold a different viewpoint. But this is, you know, there's a lot of reasons why Jesus is so important. But in relationship to fixing the world, um, Jesus is the only figure that died for everybody. Therefore, forgiveness is granted and spiritual rebirth and the ability to open up one's mind and to see things differently. That only happens through Jesus. And so another reason why he is so important to us and why we must pray with him and to him actually says he makes inter- intercession for us, okay? And so he's, he's seeing the things that are going on in the world. He's working even as we sleep, it says. And so when we walk in the world and we see things that are not right, we go to our knees. Uh, we go to our knees. We go with our friends to our knees. We just be, we become a praying uh, men, men's group. That's what, I mean, literally, if, if the men's fraternity is to change anything, it will be because we finally learn to stop fighting in the flesh 
in your marriage, with your boss, with people that don't believe what you believe, that, that really when you begin to pray and Jesus enters between you and those that you're in conflict with, that all of a sudden you get a change of heart, just enough so that the other person might get a change of heart. So um, this, is a, this is literally a battle cry, guys, to, to pray. And then finally, I'm going to wrap up this. Therefore, I want men everywhere to pray. This is verse 8, kind of a wrap up. Therefore, based on all this, Jesus being at the center, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. There's your, there's your final. God doesn't want you angry. Doesn't, um, doesn't speak of his presence and your belief in his sovereignty. And so if you find yourself just constantly angry, constantly arguing and in conflict with others, let the life of Christ have its way finally. Don't go vigilante. And I'm saying that to myself. There's this great power that we can't even see as we go to God in prayer. And it says, therefore, also, don't even dispute. Does that mean, Hugh, that we don't share our opinion? Maybe. Maybe you share it way less. Maybe, uh, I don't know, think back to all the times you shared your opinion and assess how often it worked. And if you go, well, you're right, it doesn't work that often then. Maybe, yeah, don't be angry and don't dispute anymore. Maybe for people that you would normally be arguing with, and again, it could be your spouse to your teenage daughter or son, maybe consider completely stopping all disputes and just praying, asking God day after day, morning after morning about the situation and see if something might change. This is God's power given to men. Same power that raised Jesus from the dead is now at work in you. This is what it's talking about. And if you can get 500 to 500,000 Christians to do this, and yeah, we take out Rome, which is what we did, we can certainly make our neighborhood a little bit better. And uh, maybe we can change our country if God's people would humble themselves and pray, as God says, and turn from their wicked ways. Then I'll heal their land. So the, all the, the fixing of the world begins with Jesus and his reconciling work and it carries on to completion as we pray and work and intercede and get active with him on the things in this world that are not right. So hopefully that helps. Hopefully you enjoyed my colorless wall there. That's proof I'm in a hotel and uh, we will see you later. Love you guys.